Um, I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about society's challenges seen from a social scientist's perspective. Um, the uh, operation I run, we try to apply social science to business problems and uh, basically use things like anthropology and sociology and political science to solve complex uh, business problems. And obviously that's related to the whole world of designers, have worked with designers for a number of years. Uh, in doing that, um, I've discovered um, through around 250 projects we've now done that there is a phenomenon that I call this the blind spot, which is something that business people and also often uh, leaders in the public sector have, which is um, um, a certain piece of the world that you definitely cannot see because you're so biased towards a, a specific solution. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that blind spot. And uh, the only thing that social science can really contribute with is to put light on that blind spot by understanding, just figuring out through studies and data and analysis what's really going on in the world so we can get rid of the bias that's stopping us from creating anything new, basically. We think the future will be in a specific way because we are so biased by the ideas we already have and the manipulations of the media, media industry and so on. Uh, what your colleagues are telling you, what you're hearing on conferences, the, the, the books you buy in airports. They're all telling you a story, and that's probably not how the future is going to look. Um, and uh, through various you know, works with the, especially CEOs, I discovered there are you know, a number of blind spots that are very, very big at the moment. They might change, and I, I noticed or observed at least um, six of them. The first one is the uh, Steve Jobs blind spot, which is, I want to be the Steve Jobs of my industry. Uh, I think I he heard that about 180 workshops or something like that. There's the customization blind spot, which is we want to deliver for the customers what they need, when they want it, how they want it. We, don't, we have no opinions about our products. It's up to the customers. Or the experience moves. We are now living in an experience company, and everything has to turn into a personal experience. I heard that from a pump manufacturer in Denmark, actually. The uniqueness myth, myth which is like, we want to be unique and different to be value, but why? Why can't you just be good? Why do you have to be different? You know, Toyota is not different, but they're pretty good. Uh, <clears throat> the social media myth, which is huge at the moment, which is the future is one-to-one -one marketing. If we're not on Facebook, we'll die. And all of these, they might be true, they might not be true, but when I look at these, they are you know, what I would call science. You probably know the story with uh, Ulysses. Um, and the um, sirens, which is the story that he, there's this island and there's this female birds, and they're extremely attra attractive and sexy, basically, and they, they, they sing to you in a very, very nice way, and if you're a sailor, you're attracted to them, and you want them, and you jump aboard, and you, you basically swim to the, to the island, and what happens is they will eat you, right? And it's a little bit the same with the, all these trends you hear, and all these um, ideas we have about the future, Facebook, social media, Steve Jobs, and so on. It's really just a big blind spot. And if you don't tie yourself to something and just look at the world with fresh eyes, um, I guess you're just going to get the same idea, the same bad ideas as everybody else. And I would say the reason I'm telling you this is uh, my fundamental belief about society challenges is, and that goes for politicians as well as designers, is that if you really want to change society, we have to look at it with fresh eyes and kind of get rid of that blind spot. Now I'll finish by talking a little bit about what the hell has this got to do with design, because a lot of this isn't really design, it's um, you know, social science and marketing and innovation and so on. And thinking about, you know, there's something that's irritating me, which is the movement that says, design is going to change the world. Hell no, it's not going to change the world. That's a big lie. Design can contribute. But to think that you know, the uh, nuclear plant that just exploded in Japan, that we can send a couple of designers uh, from Denmark that can do Arne Jacobsen chairs to help with that, I don't think so. So does that mean that design doesn't matter? Not at all, not at all. So I thought about this and said, what, what is really my thinking? And this is a, an early hypothesis, it might be wrong. When you're an economist, you work in two worlds. There are two worlds, there are hierarchies and there are markets. And the, 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 the more expensive something is to do together, the higher the, what's called the transaction cost, the more hierarchy you need. And the easier it is to get a lot of people just to buy it on a bazaar, on a market, the lower the cost and the more markets you would get. 
And you can say there are many, in, in changing any energy or health, there are players like UN, that's probably a big, big, big hierarchy. Governments, then you want to go down the list. I would even say global companies are hierarchies. The reason they are here is to lower transaction costs, to make it easier to make the world go around. And probably the, 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 the most market is things like social networks and the stock market. So there are players that have hierarchies and there are markets. And then there are also different ways to approach world problems. So when people meet for climate conferences, for example, they talk. When, you know, Dong, for example, or Adidas built something concrete, they act. So you have a continuum here of, um, uh, you know, you have an intent, you have a strategy, you have a plan, you have a project, you have an idea, you have a concept, you have a test, and you have a rollout. And if you put these two axes together, you have hierarchies and markets and talk and act. So where does this put design? Well, I think not in these three places. I don't think designers should help hierarchies to talk. And I don't think designers should help hierarchies to act. Or maybe they actually should. So the idea here is to say, I actually think, when I think about where design is really powerful, is when you can help companies like Adidas and Dong to take their high broad strategies and make them real prototype them, test them, make materialize them. And we can help people like uh, Christian in the public sector actually find tangible solutions to how a hospital or school should look or a waste system. I think that is where the power is. Um, an analytic example of this in our end is if you take something like uh, transport in Paris, for example. You have these four situations. You have um, um, the EU has a roadmap for how, you know, low carbon Europe should look and that, what that means for cities. Then you have the city of Paris that has a politics for, for how the city should look. Then you have companies like Renault that now says that environment is core of their strategy. But who is going to create a practical solution to this? The guys that made these bikes. They're a fantastic service design project, executed wonderfully, very thoughtful. Um, um, and very clever thought out. I don't know if you've tried it, but it actually is a wonderful system. Personally, that's when I get really proud of designers. That is when you actually make things work, as opposed to talk. So my main message is talk less and act more, um, basically. So basically, it's just finish up here. Chris, uh, so sorry about that. I don't know if I've over done it. Okay. Um, so um, uh, for me, I, I only talked about one issue, which is how do you, if I can go back, I talked about basically this. How can commercial strategies help the world to improve? And obviously there are many other players, but I think there is a big commercial opportunity for most companies to work with things like waste and climate change and so on. But the blind spot, the, the, the ideas that we already have stand in the way. And to get out of that, we cannot use intuition and we cannot use spreadsheets. We need to use something else, which is human uh, inquiry, understanding humans. Um, um, so if you started the world with real eyes, uh, I've experienced myself many, many times, how they can kind of all of a sudden give you a new idea about what you're all about. And then once you have that new idea, you need to act. And that's where I think design can be a really powerful tool uh, to help both strategists and policymakers improve the world. How do you actually measure your success? How, 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 um how can you tell that? How can you, uh, because they do something else due to your um, expert knowledge? Right. Um, I'm quite interested in the relationship between social science and designers because mm. I worked in Philips and it could be fraught or it mm. could be wonderful, mm. like most relationships. Maybe you just talk around that yeah. too. Okay, there yeah. you go. Uh, on the first one, how do you measure success? It's um, 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 the way we think about this is that when we work with these problems, we look at them as big mysteries. So we have no clue what's going to come out. So it's very difficult to measure success. So the success is, do we solve the mystery? Then that becomes what's, you know, a, a system of thought that can be implemented in a company as a strategy. And what we then measure is, can this company then build that into an algorithm that can be produced again and again and again? And that's success. So basically it is, can the company take some of these insights and use them for many years and even change their processes to do things better over years and years again? That's one way to measure it. In very commercial companies like Adidas, we have in our contract metrics for market success. 
uh, for example, market share measures and so on, and we even paid for it. So, uh, 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 for example, 50% of the fee will be success fee, for example, for scientists, which I learned, no, they cannot, because you need theory and you need training and you need, you know, so we basically retrain those. And then we thought, you know, social scientists can be designers, and I discovered, no, they cannot, they're lousy. Like, their ideas are not good. And they, and they always come home from the field and say, the world is so complicated. <laughs> and, and that's not good. So we trained them to think in much more in business terms and much less in design. So my social scientist, my anthropologist, I basically trained them to be extremely commercial and let the ideas generation and the solutions part be done by the designers. Um, they do go out to the field to get the insights and so on, but um, um, I, my experience is just then at, at some point you have to retrain them and they have to choose career. Am I a social scientist or am I more a designer that does, um, and, um, and, and there's no hierarchy in that by the way. That, uh, some of our most well-paid people are designers. So, yeah.